Hello everyone and welcome to this brief primer on holoptic foresight dynamics. My name is Frank Spencer and I am a partner and the creative director at a firm called Kedge. It is a foresight innovation and strategic design firm located in beautiful Orlando, Florida. We just celebrated our 10 year anniversary at Kedge. You may have also heard of, or you know me as the lead instructor and a founder of The Future School. The Future School has been in existence for about five years now, and it's our public-facing uh, foresight accelerator as part of our learning ecosystem. We hope that you will join us at The Future School or at Kedge so that together we can create better futures. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about tonight in this brief primer. Holoptic Foresight Dynamics is a concept and an application that we've been working on for well over 10 years now, probably uh, 10, 11, 12 years. You can look on the net and find where we've talked about it in, over the past decade and a little bit longer. And we are really, really excited about Holoptic Foresight Dynamics because um, we stand on the shoulders of giants who are doing a lot of great past and present day research around complexity science and evolutionary science and cognitive science and of course foresight and futures thinking um, and future studies. Um, but the reason we're excited about holoptic foresight dynamics is because we believe through this concept and this application that we can see a greater um, democratizing of the future, uh, a greater season of opportunities, a greater ability to solve problems and quite honestly, a way to really save the future. Now I know those are really, really bold words and I'm not claiming to have a silver bullet or the panacea for all of uh, mankind's problems. What I did mean by that is you'll see that holoptic foresight dynamics by its very, the definition of the very title itself is saying much more than just something like foresight alone uh, will save the world. It's really about how we, not just uh, um, collectively, uh, but in, uh, well beyond that, are able to uh, really create better futures, not just for all, but with all. And so with that in mind, let's get going. So the first thing that I want to share with you uh, tonight is that um, it's not just me alone, of course. Many people, as I said, stand on the sh uh, shoulders of giants. We'll name just a few of those tonight, but there are many that don't make the presentation because this is a brief primer. Uh, but I do love to share when I get the opportunity that my partner, Yvette Montero Salvatico, who I've worked with for close to a decade now, has done tremendous work in advancing the concept and the application of holoptic foresight dynamics. It really is a part of all that we do from our natural foresight framework model um, to uh, the future school, to the work that we do at Kedge. And uh, this is the kind of presentation that um, our clients, our client work, uh, don't really get a lot of access to usually. And it's not the kind of stuff that we're gonna be talking about um, when we go into client work. However, I do think many of our clients um, and people who come to the future school or those who are lurking in the background um, will be fascinated by the concept and the application of holoptic foresight dynamics because really understanding this kind of approach to foresight and futures thinking will allow us to be better futurists and better foresight practitioners in everything we do, whether it is for organizations or cities our governments, our society as a whole. So thank you to those who have continued to help in building the foresight, uh, holoptic foresight dynamics concept and application. So uh, diving right in, we see a lot of books and articles every year on how to think like a futurist. Um, what are the principles of thinking like a futurist? And all of these articles and books are wonderful um, insight into what it means to think like a futurist, to be a good trend hunter, a horizon scanner, to really make sense of the environment around us, to build scenarios about the future and um, to use those scenarios to create action today. Um, but it goes far beyond that because really futures thinking and futuring our foresight work is not something that we can do alone. The honest truth is uh, foresight is a team sport. And to be a good futurist or to really think like a futurist means to be a part of a community that thinks like a futurist. Wouldn't it be wonderful as a matter of fact, and I know that's why most of these books and articles are written in the first place, 
is everyone thought this way. Is we all thought like a futurist um, in the sense of really uh, looking at opportunities and our problems from a different perspective and really being intentional and purposeful about um, what is on the horizon and how we can act in a, a more appropriate, uh, transformative, adaptive, resilient uh, fashion towards those ideas. If we all thought that way, then the world would be a better place. And so I applaud those that write these books and articles, Think Like a Futurist, but what exactly does that really mean? Does it mean something like Minority Report? Are we like the precogs who can see echoes of the future? Should we be predicting the future? Well, some talk about predicting the future and forecasting, but in reality, we're in too much of a complex environment to do any uh, really good forecasting. I know over the last couple of years, there's been some books about forecasting the future and how some are better at it than others, but is that even what we should really be worried about doing? Is it better for us to not predict the future, but to map the future? Predicting the future makes us brittle. It makes us fragile. We try to plan out an official future. Where are these trends leading us? Where are these drivers leading us? How will the future unfold? But when we map the future, we become multifaceted, multi-empowered. We pull from many different futures and we pull them into our actions, our design, our strategy, our, um, our uh, you know, way that we want to live our lives into today, into the present. So we need to become multifaceted thinkers. We need to be uh, those who can see multiple futures all at one time. How can we best do that? Well, we can't be the precogs, but you know what? There is a beautiful metaphor inside of this movie, Minority Report, and that is the idea that it takes more than just one to look at the future. So a couple of years ago, I wrote an article called It's Time to Democratize the Future. It was Got a lot of play on the internet and people liked it and they responded to it positively and used parts of it. But here we are in 2020 and I want to ask, if it's time to democratize the future, what does that really mean? How do we go about spreading and evangelizing this idea of thinking like a futurist so that we can more appropriately approach those unfolding problems and seize those opportunities, even those that we haven't seen, that we can unearth those new ideas. So Fast Company Magazine a couple of years back uh, had an article about design thinking needs to think bigger. Now you might not be a designer, you might not care about design thinking, but I think this article says something far beyond the practice of design thinking. And that is, what is complexity and how do we actually leverage or embrace it instead of running away from it. Now, every year or I would say even actually every couple of months or maybe even uh, sooner than that, we always see articles about how to simplify complexity. How do we stop it? How do we maybe even kill it or thwart it? But the reality is that we can't. We're living in an increasingly complex world and nobody's going to put that genie back in the bottle. But the bigger question or idea is, should we even be trying to? Would that be counterproductive to not only possibilities, opportunities, but to our species, to where we're going and where we're headed? So the article here has some wonderful quotes. It says, we live in a massively complex, intricately interconnected global system, and it's increasingly impossible to be designers or even human beings without taking into account how we affect and are in turn affected by all the moving pieces of this organic machine. Now, of course, we know that today and many are saying, well, yeah, that's right. It's impossible to be a human being alive today without taking into account the complexity around us. But what do we do about it? Well, I like the second part of this article because it says the more complex an organism is, the more capable it becomes. And the more capable it is, the more it can address challenges and seize opportunities. Wait a second. That's not what all those articles have told us. We've heard all the time from great minds that we need to simplify complexity. But actually what we're learning in complexity science today, real complexity, is that complexity actually is the sign of maturity. We move from immature states of simplicity to mature states when we see more complexity. Complexity is a sign of maturity. 
A complexity actually affords us a greater landscape to paint on, to seize opportunities, to unearth possibilities, to address the challenges. As a matter of fact, many in complexity science today are even saying that because we don't embrace and leverage complexity for these things, for these reasons, we actually are exacerbating our problems. We exacerbate the world's problems. And I'm sure you can think of, as I'm saying this right now, some of the problems that we have exacerbated because why? It's not complexity that's the problem. It's our outdated mindsets from a previous age and era that are the problem. We know how the world should work based on our assumptions, our biases, and our paradigms from a previous mindset. And so when complexity moves forward and creates this bigger landscape and paints this bigger picture, it terrifies us. And so we try to simplify it to bring it back into line with our paradigm, back into line with our mindset. In reality, it's not the complexity that needs to be simplified, it's our mindset that must be complexified. We must advance into complexity in order to change that paradigm of a new world that's evolving, a new world that's unfolding. And then we will see those opportunities. Is it possible for us to actually take humanity into a new paradigm so that we can operate in a new way? Listen, Friedrich Capra said in one of his recent books, uh, just the same, but actually takes us a step further. It says, as the 21st century unfolds, a new scientific conception is emerging. It's a unified view that integrates for the first time life's biological, cognitive, social, and economic dimensions. At the forefront of contemporary science, the universe is no longer seen as a machine composed of elementary building blocks. We have discovered that the material world ultimately is a network of inseparable patterns of relationships that the planet as a whole is a living, self-regulating system. Evolution, a very important word, we're gonna come back to it again, is no longer seen as a competitive struggle for existence, but rather a cooperative dance in which creativity and constant emergence of novelty are the driving forces. And with the new emphasis on complexity, networks and patterns of organization, a new science of quality is slowly emerging. Now I want to hang with this for just a moment because you're going to hear me use the term evolution again tonight. And I know it's a loaded word and we have preconceptions when we hear the word evolution. One of the ones that stands out the most is that evolution happens when things compete against one another. Um, the competition to see which will be the fittest, the survival of the fittest. Now, many of you who are listening to this probably know that survival of the fittest really came from Herbert Spencer and the Victorian age and was really about a social concept and has been shown to be very, very, very wrong in many ways today. But we're also learning that this basic concept that we've built a lot of our organizational systems around, our cities, our societies, our planetary thinking has been centered around this evolutionary concept of competition. And evolutionary science today is learning, has been learning, is increasingly learning, that the arrow, and I'll get back to that again in a moment, the arrow of evolution, yes, there is an arrow, moves from competition to cooperation. As Fritjof Capra says here, we need a cooperative dance, not the competitive struggle. So creativity, and the constant emergence of novelty come from cooperation, collaboration, and the collective unity of thinking. This is what we have to see in order to have a foresight thinking or think like a futurist or democratize the future more effectively. If we're going to go back and write some of those books again, How to Think Like a Futurist, The Five Principles of Thinking Like a Futurist, our number one should be this cooperative dance that leads to a greater emergency, emergence of novelty in our evolutionary arrow. Now, Daniel Christian Wall has written a book recently called Designing Regenerative Cultures. If you haven't read it, I would suggest you do a wonderful book. And in the book, he talks about this same idea of complexity science and actually our participation in these systems as subjective co-creative agents. What is our goal? Our goal is to facilitate the emergence of positive or desirable properties. Let me say that again. Our goal as humanity 
is to facilitate the emergence of positive or desirable properties emerging through the qualities. Remember, Fitzroff Capra said a science of qualities is emerging. The qualities of relationships in the system and the quality of information that flows through the system. Relationships and the information. Relationships and the information. So to think like a futurist means embracing complexity, but to democratize the future means the normalization of emergence. We must, in our education, in our learning, in our organizations, in our societies, in our cultures, we must normalize complexity. We must normalize the result of complexity, which is the emergence of novel properties. One plus one doesn't equal two. Maybe it equals three. Maybe it equals 10. Maybe it equals a million. But A plus B doesn't mean AB. It's something new, the sweet spot in between. That's what complexity leads us to. And so good foresight, as Wallace says, is based on four ways of knowing, and we see them here. And that is thinking, sensing, feeling, and intuition. Now we all know thinking, and we think of that in quantitative terms and in logic, but sensing, feeling, and intuition feel much more qualitative. They can feel fuzzy to us. But complexity brings us from just thinking and logic to sensing and feeling and intuition. Good foresight is based on awful ways of knowing. It builds on our ability to anticipate a variety of future scenarios, which are not only based on our understanding of current system dynamics and trends, that's one way of foresight, but also something more that foresight is. Foresight is about sensing, about feeling, about intuiting into the future potential of the present moment. The practice of foresight and anticipation strengthens our awareness of potential future states. Let me say that again. Good foresight and anticipation will strengthen our awareness of the potential future states that are emerging through complexity. Wait a second. It sounds like we're saying that foresight is about more than just gathering a lot of information, building some great stories or scenarios about the future, and then potentially leveraging those to create new action today. It's about something more. Rion Miller starts to really get at what this is through his Futures Literacy Labs at the UN and the great work that he's done there. As a matter of fact, he says we must embrace complexity and use the future for our advantage today. Not just think about potential multiple futures that could be and leverage them. We must actually embrace complexity and use the future too. And as he says in this quote, a futures literate person is better able to detect and attribute meaning to novelty. Novelty is the result of emergence, which comes out of complexity, which is the maturity of systems. And complex emergence than someone who is futures illiterate. Becoming more futures literate can enhance human efforts to sense and make sense of complexity. Ah, so if we're going to change our paradigms, we must become more futures literate. So yeah, great. We'll use foresight. We'll use all of the insight of future studies. We'll use the methodologies and the tools and, but wait, there's something more that's being said here. Can you feel that? It's not just about getting knowledge about good foresight practice. It's the very essence of foresight itself Practice in sensing the complexity and the emergence that comes from it that allows humanity to seize opportunities that are right on the doorstep. We must change our paradigms if that's going to happen. When I'm futures illiterate, I could be standing right next to, as if a mirror universe, this novel emergence that wants to come forth, that's trying to come forth, that is supposed to come forth. And I can't touch it and I can't see it because I have not been able to democratize internally and collectively and cooperatively that foresight that will allow us to touch that emerging reality, those opportunities, the solutions. So put another way, we need to move from epistemic uncertainty to ontological unpredictability. Fancy terms that mean something simple like this. Epistemic uncertainty says, 
If I just had more data about the world, if I just had a better understanding about the past and the present and the trends that are in front of me and the things that are, 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 are around me and, 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 and the technology and the society, the social ideas and the concepts, if I just had more data, more measurement, then I would understand the world better. So epistemic uncertainty is really about gathering more data in the face of a lack of data, measuring better and having less errors, understanding the hidden variables, um, understanding the mechanics of the system, understanding how the past speaks to the future. And I'm not saying that it doesn't, but this is one way of actually measuring or doing foresight. This is a colonized way of looking at foresight. We understand what the world has what the world had and then we base our understanding of what might be next based on those ideas but ontological unpredictability tells us to step outside of that epistemics uh, knowing of gathering that data our knowledge about the world being less limited by gathering more understanding Ontological unpredictability is about creative evolution, about transformative invention. It's about qualitative states. It's about moving from simplicity to complexity, alternative futures beyond the colonization that we know, decolonized worlds. In other worlds, the world itself is a process. And evolution and breakpoints invent new categorical realities. Or put another way, the nature of the future itself is changing. Let me say that again. The nature of the future itself is changing. So it's not enough to know about trends and to use methodologies that will help us to squeeze those trends, squeeze the lemon juice out of the lemon. We have to be able to practice foresight in a, in a way that's gonna allow us to look at complexity, look at complex emergence and the novelty that's coming from it and to be able to recognize it, as Fritjof Capra said, as Riel Miller said, as Daniel Christian Wallace said, and many, many, many others. Um, I'm, as, said, as I said earlier, um, there's so many great names that I'm not including here. I just pulled some quotes out. This is just a primer. So we have to be able to see ontological unpredictability. How do we do that? That sounds so hard. Well, it can be, but I think one of the reasons that we're not doing a good job of it, or we are having a hard time even imagining how that would happen, really, is because we're not entering into a state in cooperative evolution instead of competitive or data gathering evolution or data gathering foresight, I should really say, that allows us to see a way to actually accomplish this. As a matter of fact, Real Miller that I mentioned earlier with the Future Literacy Labs at the UN calls this moving from AFF to AFE. And you can see that I put this or overlaid this on epistemic uncertainty for AFF, anticipation for the future, which is trend scanning and scouting and preparation and planning processes, to really grasping, um, embracing, leveraging AFE, anticipation for emergence. We don't want to just be futures thinkers. We want to be emergence thinkers. We want to be able to look at what's emerging in front of us and recognize it and embrace it, and leverage it, and seize it, and walk with it, and walk into it. This is a co-creative process, as David Christian Wall said. What is our goal as humanity? It is to subjectively co-create with the future. Now, this doesn't mean that I just go by the whims of trends. As a matter of fact, that's what actually anticipation for the future is. What I'm talking about is a cooperative dance of evolution, as Fritjof Kapper told us. We're in, we actually anticipate for emergence as a species, not individually, but collectively. Remember, I told you that foresight is a team sport. Evolution is a team sport. And together, they will allow us novel perception or the perception of novelty. Becoming more futures literate can enhance human efforts to sense and make sense of complexity. So we're getting close. We're not quite there yet. The punchline is coming. You might have guessed what it is already, but I'm gonna make it super clear before I finish here tonight. So all of these books and many more that are being written today are hinting sever so closely at this idea of holoptic foresight dynamics. Let's take the last step and go all the way there. If any of you have ever seen the movie Arrival, you would see this beautiful metaphor of being able to speak 
in the language of the future or the metaphors of the future in, a, in order to step into that future, anticipate it in such a way that we actually co-create with it and we create generative and regenerative systems that allow us to bring humanity into opportunities, into realities, into novelties that create something that we haven't seen before, an aspirational and transformative state of humanity. I don't want to ruin the movie Arrival for you if you've never seen it before, but Louise actually is able to see General Chang in the future because of the language that she has learned from the alien species that have visited the Earth that thinks in a circle, past, present, and future all be one time, instead of in a linear way that we do today, past is past, future is future, and we can't see it. And this circular way of thinking, or not just of thinking, but of sensing, of feeling, and of intuiting, we actually see past, present, and future simultaneously. We see what's emerging, and this language of the future allows us to be more anticipatory. So as many have even said about this anticipatory system or anticipatory science, it is really the evolution of great cooperation, not of competition. Um, as Robert Rosen said many, many years ago, an anticipatory system is a natural system that contains an internal predictive model of itself and of its environment, which allows it to change state at an instant in accordance with the model's predictions pertaining to a later instant. We're seeing this in biology. We've seen it for many years. And this is a science, the science of anticipation, that allows us to move far beyond this um, competition that we've had uh, swirling in our brains about how the world works, or how systems work, how our organizations ought to work. He goes on to say that the presence of a predictive model serves foresight precisely to pull the future into the present. A system with a good model thus behaves in many ways as if it can anticipate the future. And this is going to require an entirely new paradigm, an anticipatory paradigm, if you would. Now, in order to do that, we have to, as many organizations seem capable of doing, have an internal surrogate for time as part of a model that can indeed be manipulated to produce anticipation. In particular, this internal surrogate of time must run faster than real time. You see this in things like, what will I do at tomorrow's meeting at 5 o'clock? Or, as Rosen has joked before, Linus in the pumpkin patch, waiting for the great pumpkin to emerge at Halloween, anticipating it. But it's something much deeper than that. Internally, we can move beyond time and space to experience the future cooperatively so that our arrow of evolution and complexity points towards understanding emergent novelty. This is good foresight. Now, biology provides us, as Rosen says, with existence proofs and specific examples of cooperative rather than competitive activities. And these insights that we're even speaking about tonight, um, they are resources that can be harvested. Resources perhaps even more important to our ultimate survival as a species than the more tangible biological resources, food and energy. How could that be? Well, because those resources We'll make sure that we have food and energy in the future. What food do we need to evolve into? What energy do we need to evolve into? What futures do we need to evolve into? We need to learn this anticipatory system from biology. And it is a biological one for us as well as a species, a cooperative species, a collaborative species, a collective species. So I know that many of you who are listening to this are thinking, hour of evolution, I can't wait for you to get back to that. I've never heard this before. Or if you have, maybe you haven't looked into all the great work that's being done on it today by many wonderful uh, people around the world. But there is a trajectory of evolution. Is there a place it's trying to lead us to? And I've already told you what that is. From simple systems to complex systems. From origins to global entities. From uh, simplicity to diversification and integration. We've all heard that greater diversity breeds creativity, and we see this in terms of the rainforest and city development and planetary systems. But it's important for us to understand that patterns of evolution show a general trend towards diversification and subsequent or parallel integration at a higher level of systemic complexity. 
This immigration tends to happen predominantly through the creation of more complex organisms, more social entities, primarily by collaboration and symbiosis. I want that to just to sink into you, that we are going to move to higher levels of systemic complexity, integration, diversification, and ultimately global entities through collaboration and symbiosis. This is the arrow of evolution itself. And so in that sense, it's important for us to understand this concept of intentional evolution. Collaboration, cooperation, and collective global diversification and a global entity means that we have to take evolution into our own hands. Our environment of accelerating complexity is driving an active and participatory form of human development instead of simply allowing our collective path to unfold by accidental means, by fate, or by biological means. We have to participate in this evolution. And of course, many will be able to think today that we've been doing that through technology. It's one of the things that really stands out. But we need to move far beyond technological evolution. And by the way, roads and fire, they're technology. So don't just think of technology as being your phone. But it's true that all of these different forms of technology are these co-helpers throughout history have always caused man to evolve in different ways. We need to not only evolve technologically, but socially, organizationally, and in every one of these ways, collaboratively, cooperatively, and collectively. So we're actively participating in humanity's evolution, or at least according to the hour of evolution, we should be. Now, let me just, before I dive into the punchline here, which you've already guessed at this point, show you that there are different environments that we could think of today when we think of building our organizations, or building our companies, or building our cities, or our societies. And that is a monoptic view, where we could have a top-down or a side-to-side -side view, where we pass on information, or the actors and players are sort of in a line um, from top-down to, uh, command and control, or an environment of separation. This is a linear environment, one of centralization, as I said earlier, colonization, of individualism, of tribal separation, and of top-down hierarchies. Now, we have become more familiar in recent years with panoptic environments. Think of social media, for instance, where we can um, broadcast to our audience, and many actors and players are involved, and sort of like the faculty in prison, the idea of Foucault's prison environment, that the warden can look onto the prisoners and see them all at one time from a lofty environment, um, but the prisoners don't see one another. As a matter of fact, I think that's not actually a bad analogy, because this panoptic environment does not take us into the opportunities, into the solutions we're going to need. It leaves us much like prisoners in a panoptic prison. And that's the environment we find ourselves in today as many of our problems are being exacerbated by old paradigms or old panoptic paradigms or even new panoptic paradigms. We need a holoptic environment. As I said early on, the fly's eye, or maybe I didn't say it early on, but if I didn't, this word holoptic actually refers to the way that many insects see. Our eyes are in the front of our head. They look out and see what's right in front of us. An insect's eye can often be described as being holoptic. Not all insects have holoptic eyes, but many do. They cover the entire front of the head, side to side, up and down, front to back, so that when they look out at the world, they see many things at once, and all of those many things become a whole or a one. They see the many, many, many different things in front of them as a one. I want that to soak in too. Because if we are going to build everything that has come before in this presentation, we are going to have to see humanity as a collective holotic whole. And it's not just about seeing ourselves, as Fritjof Capra says, as one whole entity or as an ecosystem that is interconnected. It goes beyond that. We are going to have to be able to see as Wall says, think, but feel, sense, intuit, as a whole. So holoptic is one and the many see one another, see themselves, and see a whole entity or a global entity, as we showed from the earlier slide, the arrow of evolution. This is an environment of intentionality, of multiples, of emergence, of decentralization, a swarming of 
common experience of a blurring of hierarchies, of complex adaptive systems, but even more than that. And so this is really what holoptic foresight dynamics is. It is the collective or cooperative or collaborative movement of embracing foresight as an evolutionary trait in order to see the unfolding or emerging novel or novelty that is in front of us in order to seize it cooperatively and as co-agents of creation so that those opportunities can take us further into the future. That was a mouthful, but one of the things I really want you to grasp at this point is that foresight in this concept becomes part of that evolutionary trait. It's not enough just to think like a futurist. It's not enough just to democratize the future. We need to embrace and understand foresight as an evolutionary trait. Up to now, we've thought about our evolution as being competitive. Now we need to see it as being collaborative, which means that foresight itself is a trait for humanity to evolve into. So I put it in four different ways. Holoptic foresight dynamics is about the co-creation of emerging properties that are greater than some of the parts involved. But that means it's also about perception by the parts, the people, the nodes, the actors, the structures of that emerging whole as a unique entity, perception, foresight. It is also an awareness by the parts within a system of their individual diversity, as well as their role in creating or co-creating the emerging whole and the larger purpose. And then ultimately, that means that it must be an intentional or a purposeful evolutionary movement practiced by the parts and the whole. And now we can understand why foresight is so important and what it means to really think like a futurist. It means that this trait must be embraced must be fostered and must be cultivated in the collective if we are going to actually democratize the future and quite honestly, save humanity and save the world. So I just wanted to, for you to be able to see this equation about holotic foresight dynamics, which will help you to really understand this collaboration plus complexity, which is amplified many, many times over by this practice of intentional foresight equals emergent perception by the whole of humanity. And this is not just a linear equation, it is a recursive loop, or what I call the recursive loop of intentional evolution. That then again, that emergent perception leads us back to greater collaboration, cooperation, and the embrace of complexity, again, amplified by the emergent trait or the evolutionary trait of foresight, not just a practice, an actual trait in humanity. Is it possible to intentionally cultivate this holoptic foresight dynamics as a collective social evolutionary human trait? And if so, could this lead to an evolutive futures orientation that is biological, that's neurological, that's cognitive? The answer is Yes, but it's going to require that we practice within a new paradigm of governance, of organizational development, and social dynamics. Cultivating holotic foresight will require a new mindset, a new vision, and a brand new approach. And so to close out this short primer on holotic foresight, because as you can imagine, there's much more to say here and much more to study here, is to look at the way that we have thought about future, about futuring, and about foresight in our organizations, and in our present paradigm. By its very definition, future takes us out of our present paradigm, and yet it's hard to do that by ourselves. It requires the collective to recognize that emergence. So we often think of the future as a time, which means we can put it off to a later date. And when we do that, we operate with the future as a probable um, uh, quantity. The future, in other words, is reductively determined by our past, by the things we know, probable futures. And that's when we think of the future as a time. But in reality, we can supersede that by thinking of the future as a place or a space. And that makes things a little bit better. That brings us into possible futures. 
In other words, the future is recursively expressed as shared dominant beliefs about the present. But that still leaves us stuck, doesn't it? Because we only are able to interpret what might be in front of us by the trends that we see, by the collection of those trends that we see, by the drivers that we see. So we build scenarios about possible futures, but we still are building them from those dominant beliefs that we hold. And so we're able to supersede the future as a time by understanding it as a place that we can investigate, that we can walk around in, that we can do ethnography in and see how people live and how they work and what it means to be a human being 50 years or 100 years from now. But it still leaves us in that dominant belief system. We have to supersede that by seeing the future as being more than centralized or linear or siloed or closed. We have to see it as more than, uh, than the future being defined by time and space and our present day decisions being constricted by time and space. In order to do that, we have to see the future as an encounter or an experience. And this is operating from a place of understanding the future as complexity, from the outside in, not the inside out as decentralized thinking, knowing, feeling, intuiting, from spiral um, understandings of the future, from emergent or post or transdisciplinary uh, places in the future. In other words, the future can be experienced outside of time and space, because remember, as Rosen said in anticipatory systems, we can have experience as a surrogate for time internally, and not just individually, but more important, collectively, at, in the sense that foresight becomes an evolutionary trait for humanity. Time, space, surrogate exists inside of us collectively, and therefore our present day decisions are not constricted by time and space. And this, as Ilika Tuomi says, is a constructivist view of foresight. Now the future is a matrix, internally, collectively, cooperatively, for birthing and creating new, novel, emergent realities by embracing and leveraging complexity. In this way, we rethink, we reframe, and we redefine the nature of the future itself. And this, in essence, is holoptic foresight dynamics. The all-knowing, all-seeing eye, so to speak, again, not predicting, but being able to presence, to percept what is emerging, how we better understand what can be, what is trying to be, and bring humanity into greater opportunities, the solving of problems, and what it means to become more complex, to mature, and those novel states of being.